I think since you're all staff and volunteers, we don't need to do a big introduction, but this is Stephen Waltz, and he's here to do a training for you all about the Day to Night exhibit. Um, questions are going to be okay? Sure, anything, anything you guys are curious about, yeah. I'm and happy to answer. I will just tell you that when we found out about this exhibit at the National Geographic Museum, which was... A year and a half ago? Yeah. A year ago? Yeah. It was there. Uh, we were working out summer exhibits for the future, and this just seemed like a natural fit for us. Uh, we've had great success with other exhibits from National Geographic in the past, um, and so it was just a kind of a, a no brainer that we would get this, and it certainly exceeded our expectations. Um, and so we're really happy to have Stephen here to talk to us this morning. And I'm happy to be here. All right, yeah, yeah, this is great. Great thrill to be here and to have my work in such a beautiful museum. And I'm looking forward to sharing as much as I can in terms of the process of what I do so you guys have you know, insight into the work when people do ask you questions. So uh, my, uh, I'm going to be talking over myself. <laughs> I do have an identical twin, and so sometimes people say I'm stereo. Uh, but what, I, what ends up happening is um, uh, my process really begins, um, I shoot what I call iconic places that are part of what I call our collective memory. So things that are familiar with everyone. And uh, the work started in New York. It was kind of a love letter to New York City. And I began photographing epic views of the city that were these iconic views, but I shoot them from a perspective that you'd never seen them before. And, I, and, and then what I started to do was the idea of compressing time into one photograph became this thing for me. And using technology, uh, digital technology, what I do is I essentially photograph from these elevated views anywhere from 12 to 36 hours. And I don't move my camera, and I'm, I'm basically a street photographer. So everything that you see in my picture is something I've seen with my eye. And that's really important. People think, look at a lot of digital work and they think, oh, the guy sets up a time lapse and suddenly he's just, you know, having cappuccinos and then comes back later and, and melds it all together. That's not what I do. I work in the sense of the most traditional way in photography. So if Steichen or Stieglitz or Ansel Adams, I'm hand-cocking a lens, I'm looking, taking a picture. It's what I do in the post side of my work that changes the way we think about a photograph. So the concept is really about... Um, it, photography has been based historically on the idea of a single moment, right? You know, that's what it started as, capturing a single moment in time. Technology has now evolved, so I can now capture more than one moment. And because I can do that, it's enabling me to take a single frame and meld hundreds of moments together. And the concept of compressing time came to me. And so when you look at a lot of these photographs, you're going to see day change into night, and this is this perfect harmony between my in all my images. That harmony is created based on what I call as a time vector. So let me let me walk over here because I want to show you to show you this with a day to night image. So when people when you, people examine my work, I, initially you, you actually get a sense that this is almost um, you don't know you're looking at time change, but because you're just captivated right by the by the sort of harmony and the essential beauty that the, the artist image has. But it's upon looking closer, and that's what my work's about. I invite you into my pictures. You know, there's a whole story going on in these photographs. So this is night, uh, and uh, time changes from night to day, and then, of course, the sun sets. So this vector is, is, is a, uh, on the y-axis. So time changes from the left to the right. In some of my pictures, like the flamingo shot, it's on the x-axis. So day starts on the bottom of the picture, and time changes vertically. And you can actually see the shadows rotate in my pictures. You can see, I mean, I'm very strict to where time is in a photograph. So how I do it is, I, I begin by um, finding this epic view. And then, and as you can see in that picture across the way, what it was like for me to stand and do this. Uh, but that's what I do. I stand like that for 36 hours and watch what's in front of me. And it's like a real-time puzzle going on in my head. So people always ask, how do you meld these things together so seamlessly? So for every moment you see here, I have moments where there are no birds in the sky. And then what I do is I create a photograph, what I call a master plate, that enables me to compress 
the time that I'm going for. Whatever, the, whatever I say is the, um, the vector of time, I create a master plate based on that vector. So for this, it's, you can see the sun setting, you know, the early afternoon, early morning, the twilight in the evening, and of course the moon setting. I create a photograph like that, and then based on time and where the light was, these other moments get blended seamlessly into one picture. So you can see this is a certain time of day, there's another transition here, there's another transition here. You can actually see the light rotating in these birds, right? Uh -huh. So th that's the level of detail I go. But one thing that's really important about my work is you never feel the hand in, in, in my pictures. You never feel the hand. It's really about, for me, this whole body of work, especially as I've moved it now from shooting cities into wildlife, and now I'm moving into endangered species with it, is that um, I'm telling a story, a story about uh, migration in these pictures that the only people that really get to see this are really scientists. So I'm trying to take you, the visual, the viewer, to see the communication that these birds have with one another, the mating rituals that these birds have. All of these kinds of things are very, very important to my photographs. So I, in a way, I'm an artist, but I work like a scientist in a way. And what I'm trying to do is give you, the viewer, this experience of what it's physically like to be in the place I'm in. My work is really about like trying to create a window. Uh, if people, you know the history of photography, Duguerre started, he, was, uh, he created a wonderful thing, he was an illusionist really, and before he invented photography, he created a thing called the diorama. And dioramas were, at the time, the most extraordinary visual effects that were ever created. Uh, he was wildly successful with this. And what he was passionate about was the idea of trying to recreate the way he saw the world. That's what led him eventually to create a photograph, right, um, a daguerreotype. And my passion is very similar. I'm interested in showing you exactly what it feels like to see the way I see. And so my pictures are about depth, clarity, and storytelling. And, and that's really what this work's about. And it, it's my hope that you when, you, when people experience these pictures, especially the kids, that they have a whole new appreciation for wildlife, and, and particularly the bird migration, and see that, that, that birds, we can learn so much from studying these creatures. Um, you know, there's the old adage of the canary in the coal mine. Well, in, in many ways, birds are, you know, are direct descendants from dinosaurs, right? They're, they connect to our past. And in the same way, they also will protect what our future is going to be. So um, those are some of the things I love to impart. Um, I've kind of gone off on a wild talent, a little bit of a wild tangent. So, um, but if there, is there any questions that people have right off the bat in terms of, uh, sure. Did you plan to go out when there's a full moon? Like yes, I did, absolutely. There's an enormous amount of planning. Uh, my wife, Betty, who I don't know if she's in the room right now, but she's my producer. So. To give you a concept of how complicated these pictures are and how much luck I need, uh, for example, when you're shooting wildlife like this, yes, I knew I had a full moon rise on the island. I had that not only get the moon, the full moon, but also get a very quiet and great night, right, where the weather's good. You know, you know you're on in the middle of the North Sea there. Uh, I'm off the coast of Edinburgh. The weather can tr change like that. And again, I'm standing on, an, on a place 36 hours. Uh, there's no shelter for me. Uh, I'm in the elements. And let's walk over this way, um, because this one was one of the most challenging ones. This is one of the most remote islands um, off the Falklands. It's called the Steve Jason. And it, it took me, oh boy, I had to fly to Chile, and then I had to take a small plane to an island called Carcass. And then from there, I actually took about a six and a half, seven hour boat ride. And uh, this, there may be a 50 people have ever set foot on this island. It's actually controlled by WCS. They have a, their own single house on it with a 1970s Land Rover. And that's it. And there's no one else on the island. Nobody. And the birds and the wildlife there have never really seen people before. So they really don't know what to do with you. Um, <laughs> Black-browed albatrosses are, are phenomenal species. Probably my favorite bird. If people say to you, God, what was the your favorite bird. And if I had to come back as a bird, I'm coming back as a black <laughs> Um So this is, you can actually, when you, when you show this photograph, I'm going to point out specific things. This nose rubbing is part of their mating ritual. These birds will mate for 50 years to life, okay? So they are, 
really extraordinary on so many different levels. Um, they uh, go through this kind of mating dance. Uh, as they begin to like each other, they get closer together before they decide, okay, you're the one. And, um, and then and you'll actually see um, a mother teaching a baby how to fly here. They will actually, you can see them teaching the children how to fly. The mother will uh, fly as, mu as many as 10,000 miles just to feed her baby. She will fly 10,000 miles, come back, and then feed the baby. And um, the chicks are adorable. You, you just don't want to get too close to them. And if you do, you want to make sure the wind's at your back because they have this horrible little habit of projectile vomiting on you. <laughs> the babies do not like um, human beings. They don't, they're, they're afraid of us. But the, the, the actual uh, albatrosses were incredibly, they look at you and they say, Oh, come on in, just be careful, watch my child, just don't do anything stupid, and you're welcome, you know. And then this is one of my favorite parts. So these are the rockhopper penguins, which I swear to God I watched them babysit for the albatross babies. Um, they have this incredible uh, connectivity, the way they work together, the way they share. They, they seem to um, uh, really uh, have this wonderful kind of connectivity, uh, friendship almost, and, and they look out for one another. It's, it's quite extraordinary to watch that. And if you look all the way at the edge of this picture, you're going to see all these rock, these are uh, the rock hoppers are all the way down here. That's where a lot of them stay. And they very slowly will walk up. And so you'll see there's, there are a few of them in my picture. They're kind of hidden. It's like kind of a Where's Waldo? Where are the rock hopper penguins in this picture? <laughs> so I think that's always a fun thing to share with the kids, too, is what's happening in this photograph. But this is 36 hours. These birds will actually use less energy sitting, uh, flying, than they will sitting on their nest, if you can believe that. That's how efficient they are. And when you look at this, this is like their glide path. It, all day long, it's as if you're, I, to me it was like being at Kennedy Airport during Christmas weekend. <laughs> you, the planes come in and, and they circle and boom, they come in. I could actually set my camera up and I could wait. If it's within five or 15 seconds, another bird comes right down the same venue, the same flight path because they're such efficient gliders, they go right where the wind is. And so once you know where they're flying, what their flying route is, they, they, they lock into it like that. And it's, um, it's something really to behold. This was sunrise. That was the extraordinary morning light that I had. And of course, when you get a rainbow like that, the next thing you get is a heavy rainstorm, which I had the weather. And you'll see in the video and some of the pictures, to get to this location, just to give you an idea, uh, it's an eight mile, the island is an eight mile circumference. I had no maps, nothing. I had to find where these birds were. To get to these birds, you see this greenery here? That's about six feet tall, to give you an idea of scale. So it's called tussock, and um, when you go into it, you could disappear forever. It's one of those things where, because you can't see, it's, if you don't have like a, a compass or a real, some type of way of seeing where you are, it's really easy to get lost. The other thing that's a little scary about tussock is sometimes these giant, you know, seals and, the, and, the, and these, uh, they, these other animals come in to sunbathe in the tussock. So you could be walking through and suddenly stumble on, you know, an elephant seal and you're like, <laughs> you don't want to surprise those guys at all. But uh, it, it was uh, quite an experience. But we hiked down um, probably about a mile uh, into this area with eight cases of equipment. I set up shop, and that's where I did the picture. And um, you know, it was just one of those uh, magical experiences. But uh, um, you know, these nests are all reused, also, which is really interesting. They'll, you know, they, they don't. The, the birds will re after a, a bird gives birth and the, the child leaves. Some other uh, albatross will take over that nest. And you know, fix it up like you know. Oh, look! I found a house. It's going to be a fixer up. <laughs> uh, they really are something special. So, anyway, let me. Um, here are some more. These are these are uh, what are called gaggles. And uh, so, what what's so interesting about this breed is uh, they will leave. Um, one of the sad, sad things, but heartwarming stories with this species is that. There are moments where a mother will be flying 10,000 miles for food, and the baby will have figured out how to fly and will leave the nest. And the mother comes back, and she doesn't get to say goodbye to her child. And so it's a very kind of traumatic thing, right? But the children always come back. 
they come back as teenagers and they have these gaggles. They know where they were born. And so these are the, the teenagers come back. It's like, hey, you know, you back home for the week? Yeah, let's have, you know, let's hang out, that kind of thing. It's, it's really um, quite astounding, the sort of uh, uh, microcosm of this, this world that they, they have. Um, uh, and I, and I, I really enjoyed sort of bearing witness to it. And, that, and that's the thing about my work. You know, I'm sitting for 36 hours. People always ask me, how do you do that? How do you focus for 36 hours? And for me, it's um, this extraordinary thing that I'm witnessing, you know. It's a real-time puzzle that I'm putting together in my head as time changes. But also, I get captivated by the nuances, the gesture, the communication. I'm learning as I'm photographing, and I'm trying to capture very specific moments as time changes. And, um, you know, in the end, it's, like I said, I, I really hope that when people look at this, you get the physical sense. And I feel really excited about these large, large prints because I think they really do make you feel uh, like you're there. I mean, that, and that's really the idea. Yeah. So uh, these are some other detail images, again, um, with the birds. Uh, when it rains, you, you know, it's quite extraordinary. But again, you, you, they act like little magnifying glasses. You can see the details in their feathers and stuff. Uh, and then this, which is really kind of neat for kids to, to come and play with time, right? Uh, back and forth. And, you know, you get to see how light and time changes, you know. And again, this is what, what this is, and this is important for you to share. This is not how I make my photograph. I shoot a time lapse with a separate camera system strictly as a study guide. And it's become almost a... They've become individually, now I'm developing in this, because uh, I have such a broad body of work on s simple time lapses like this, I'm actually creating this kind of an idea as a, as a single standing piece of artwork. But what, what you're able to do here is it really see how time and light moves in my picture. And that's something that's important to me, because when I create these images, sometimes I'm not sure where day and night is going to begin. And what I do is I, I have my time lapse, and I can see how very quickly how light and time moves. So it's, it's, it's a, really a study guide, but I think it's wonderful to be able to share this, um, especially with the kids, because they get to sort of play and stop time and go backwards and forwards in time. So uh, I think that's, that's really fun. But I want to be clear, it's definitely not, I don't use that to make my photographs, you know. My photographs are really single moments that I see. And, and again, at the end of the day, I then take, I sometimes will shoot almost 2,000 images in one place, 2,200 on some of them. And then I edit down to 50 of the best single moments based on time. And those moments get blended seamlessly into the master plate to create one seamless, harmonious image, compressing my memory of that day the way I saw it, the best moments of that day. And that's really what the work's about. Uh, so let's uh, let me take you over here. Stephen, what program do you use to do that? It's uh, Photoshop. It's, it's Photoshop. available to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, you know, uh, you know, in, in the history of photography, um, and this is what's interesting is that you know, there was this drive um, upon the creation of the first image by Daguerre. It's, there's always been a drive to capture the world the way we see it, right? The way we see it. And for me, um, what I've stumbled into is this idea of time and how time is this thing we never can really get our hands around, right? It's like, when did I get so old? When did I get gray hair? When did the kids grow up? All those things that we all deal with, right, as we age. Uh, and in a strange way, my work is, is putting a face on time. And I take this single day, this concept of single day, the magic of what happens in a single day, the story that <coughs> unfolds within a single day. Um, and particularly now with species, um, I'm, I'm really excited to um, share this work out there because I think it's really a celebration of, uh, of our natural world. And I feel like, you know, almost on a historical level, uh, with what's going on in our, with the climate change and what's happening, um, you know, I want to show people how magical this is, why this is so important to save, why it's so important to get involved mm -hmm. and do, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, as individuals, what we can do to inspire people. And a, my hope is that 
when people see, you know, a young person looks at birds mm -hmm. who never thought anything about a bird picture before, suddenly becomes a birder, you know. And I, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't a bird guy before I did this project, but I'm a birder now. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. You know, I have like a whole different level of appreciation for birds now. Uh, this picture, to give you an idea, if you bring people up, you can actually, these are sandhill cranes. I spent 36 hours in a blind that I had built two weeks prior to the actual migration happening. This is a very, very challenging, probably of all the birds between this and the, um, uh, the pink flamingos are the two most difficult species to photograph. Mm -hmm. And the reason is these are hunted most places in the world, except in Nebraska and a few other states where they actually migrate. And what's magical about these birds is, first of all, you're looking at birds that actually have an eight foot wingspan. That's the scale that you're talking about here. And um, I had to build a blind two weeks before the migration came in because when the birds came in, I wanted them to feel like nothing had changed. If I built my blind when the birds were there, they never would have stayed in this area. That's how spookable they are. If you turn a white light on, they leave. If you sneeze too loud, they leave. Uh, so there's a, you know, you, you can't even imagine how quiet you have to be for that. So uh, we built the blind. I stayed in it for 36 hours with my assistant. And we witnessed this spectacle. And it is unlike, if somebody had said to me, gee, Stephen, you know, the most beautiful thing you may ever see in your lifetime is the Sandhill crane migration in Nebraska. I'd say, seriously? <laughs> really? Nebraska? Flat Nebraska? But seriously, it is. And what you're witnessing in this photograph is my memory of the morning and the night together, right? The afternoon. Because let's face it, these birds, they're sleeping here. And if you look closely, you can actually see them tucked into themselves. How these birds sleep. So it's in the picture. <clears throat> and then as the light begins to come up, you see they awaken. And now they fly out to the field. And now they're going, you know, everybody in Nebraska loves these birds so much that they till their fields for them so they have plenty of food to eat. And now they're out and they're soaring and they're having a great time. And you can see time transition. Right now it goes from, from the afternoon now, it changes into the night. And now they're flying back in to roost. And this is them landing in the evening. So it's, um, and that's actually moonlighting uh, the far, far edge. What you're seeing is when these birds come in, people go to me, are there really this many birds? Yeah, there are actually this many birds. I will tell you that few things in my life I've ever seen. At sunrise, when these birds come up, and you just imagine, they take over the sky. So they completely fill your peripheral vision, very much like my photograph. You become completely immersed in, there's not a, it's not just sky, it's, it's like fabric. And because they, they uh, are so spookable, when one bird senses something, the other one reacts, so it's like emergent behavior, like schools of fish, <clears throat> and they undulate like this. So imagine the sky becomes a billowing piece of fabric, and it is unlike anything I've ever seen. I actually could not take a picture for about 10 or 15 seconds because my, the air left my lungs because what I was witnessing was that spectacular. That's how beautiful it is. Yeah, so it's, it's really something special. What's the sound and like? What is it now here, the sound is, is pretty cool, and that's a really important element. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. When they come in, it sounds like a train coming. You hear, and they come in in waves. And that's how I was able to do this picture. They literally come in in like bands of waves. And then the, the bands build upon each other like this. It is, it's something that is just extraordinary. But all of these things, um, you know, one of the things I do when I do this work is I, I will study the species, I try to learn as much as I can about the behavior, uh, about the habitat that I'm photographing in. Um, and then, you know, I just need a lot of luck. I, 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 I had a, a wonderful uh, guy named, um, oh my gosh, Mike, Fo uh, Mike Fosberg, uh, who's, I don't know if you know Michael's work, yeah. Wonderful guy, spent his, literally, he is the, one of the great authorities on this species in the world, in, this, in particular this area. And Michael was so generous with me because he loved the concept of what I was doing and he loved the fact that I was going to bring attention to this area and to this species. And so he said to me, so how long are they going to give you, Stephen? You know, how many weeks are you going to be shooting this picture? I go, weeks? It's called day to night. 
I have like, you know, it's, it's 36 hours or whatever, you know, and uh, that's it. So he goes, wow, well, good luck. You know, sometimes they don't show up. You know, even though it's migration, there are times they just don't come back. So, again, so much luck has to happen for what I do to do what I do. So, um, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's that one. Let me, um, that's also, this is a detail. Um, sometimes I, I, I have, I'm a voracious photographer, so um, if I'm not shooting my day-to-night image and I'm seeing something long, I, I'll grab another body and I'll, I'll start shooting. This was with a, almost a 1,000 millimeter lens or an 800 millimeter lens uh, because I'm fascinated by the way the birds fly through the sun and uh, the patterns they, they, they keep. Uh, just something kind of magical about that. Uh, so we can go back and take you through this area. So this is, um, now we're in Lake Begoria. And uh, so Lake Begoria, it's just one of the most fabulous places uh, that I've ever been. And uh, these pink flamingos love this lake so much. In fact, when I got there, I was told that there were probably more flamingos in Lake Begoria while I was there than they've almost ever seen. So that was a lot of good luck. Believe it or not, <coughs> this picture was never supposed to be shot in Lake Begoria. I was supposed to go to Rio Largatos to do this photograph. Because in Rio Largatos is the actual nesting area for the lesser flamingos. And so the, when, when a bird nests, you have to have the perfect combination of sand. It has to be you know, moist enough, but it also has to be able to hold its shape. Otherwise, the nest breaks apart, and the eggs can die. So, so real Argatos has the perfect sand. I spent almost eight months planning it with the Mexican government, getting access. They wouldn't let me shoot in the tower in real Argatos over this extraordinary area, which for every year, for the last 20 years, the birds have come and actually nested in. Two weeks before my shoot, I get a phone call. Stephen, you can't come. I go, what do you mean I can't come? Because the birds haven't come. They're not here. They're, something's happened. Something's changed. The water temperature, the level of the water, something has changed their, their, their nesting habits. And they're not nesting where they normally nest. So I called my editor, Kathy Moran at Geographic. I go, we, we don't have uh, flamingos now. What are we going to do? And we started talking, and she brought up uh, Africa. And I remember I had been to um, um, in Tanzania, and I remember there are some lakes that are adjacent to Kenya that have these extraordinary flamingos. And we started looking. I got a fantastic producer locally uh, in Kenya who went out and he said, Stephen, I got, we've got a ton of birds. Now, they're not nesting, but I'll tell you right now, in Lake Begoria, we have a huge, huge, huge amount of birds right now. So if you want to try to get a flamingo picture, this is the place to come. So that's what we ended up doing. So I, I took a trip, went there, and I spent about three days, four days, finding this location. And I discovered it. You're going to see there's a video of it. And one of the things that broke for me was climate change worked in my favor in this photograph. So do you see the greenery in the hills here? This is the dead of dry season. That never happens. You never get greenery like that in the dead of dry season in Kenya. It doesn't happen. Because dry season is dry season. There's no rain. So everything's supposed to be like dry. It wasn't. For five weeks as I got there, every night at 9.30 we had these thunderstorms. Lightning and massive rain would come down. And that massive rain would generate a fresh water stream right in front of the edge of the lake. And these birds, as much as they like this diaphanous water with, you know, all kinds of, you know, volcanic stuff in it, that's what they love to eat on, you know, that's what they feed. But when it comes to bathing, these birds cannot resist fresh water. It's just something that's part of, they, they just, it's like, you know, like, do you want to stay at the Ritz or do you want to, like, you know, rough it tonight? The birds say, let's go, we got the Ritz, we're going to the Ritz tonight. And so the birds said, okay, we're going to the Ritz. So they, they actually get out and... Uh, my hunch was, I'm trying to think about why would they stay here? Because I'm going to build this scaffolding, and I'm thinking about they're going to see this scaffolding, and they're going to say, ta-ta, photographer, nice knowing you. You know, I don't care if you work for National Geographic. That means nothing to us. So I'm trying to figure out, like, why would they want to stay here? And the fresh water became the why. And so I decided to build my 30-foot tower right on the edge of the fresh water. And my hunch was right. The birds came back for the fresh water. 
And so what I wasn't prepared for was this. These guys, these marabou storks, became really <clears throat> the, the most important almost element in the photograph because they were the greatest assistance I could have ever asked for. So people look at this picture and they go, how do you change time through all those birds? Well, marabou storks are the natural predator. That, that's their, what they hunt are lesser flamingos. And they work together very strategically, not unlike velociraptors do in Jurassic Park. And I'm being dead honest with you. If you watch these things like I did for 36 hours, this guy, he's the leader. Okay, you see him walking. He looks like the general. I called him the general. He would almost be communicating orders. These guys, uh, this is in the morning. You see how the birds are gathering? If you look closely at the photograph, you'll notice the birds are gathering in the morning light, right? That's because they're sensing an attack is coming from the front. What they don't know is they're being set up. So here are all the other marabou storks waiting for all of them to be pushed directly into them. This is what I watched for 36 hours. It was unbelievable. It was like a military game. And they, every hour, they would have an attack. And that attack allowed me to change time through the photograph because they essentially cleaned the plate for me. There were very specific areas where the birds would disappear. Picture. Next set, they calm down, no more attack. The birds go back to feeding, bathing, different time of day. Boom, another attack. This, this entire thing, you see this, that's one moment. At 5.30 at night, a double attack from the back and the rear. Every bird that was on the ground went up into the sky. I've never seen anything like it. It reminded me of, I studied abstract you know, painting and uh, I studied art history. And it, it was like, you know, someone, t it, almost like a pointillism against the green, just throwing paint like a Jackson Pollock. It was just, just explosive energy of, and if you look closely, you can see the, the actual, it's almost like a stencil, this hot pink stencil under their wings. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just something that, you know, in a million years, you couldn't have, I couldn't have planned it. You know, I couldn't have planned it. The fact that it happened at that moment in time was just, you know, extraordinary. And so it just really made the photograph. But it's day vertically tonight. You can see the actual stars in the African sky. Yeah. Any other questions on that? These uh, are, I rented a helicopter uh, because I never can take enough photographs. And I figured if there's more birds here than anybody's ever seen, I got to get up in the air and photograph this. So I rented a helicopter and I did this series of, of photographs um, of the flamingos from above. And so that's um, a lot of these images here that you see. Um, those are all from that series. And then, um, again, part of my series, uh, you know, again, I, I study art and impressionism. I, I, I love this quality of, uh, this is shooting with a long lens. And what I do is I move with the birds and I'm shooting at the slow shutter speed. And I'm interested in, in capturing this sort of movement that they have against the background. And so the, the blurriness of it, the, the sort of the softness of the color, was, was the way it felt when I was there. It was this almost an impressionistic quality. Um, watching these birds fly uh, uh, as they leave in mass, as they go across the water, it struck me almost the way of blood vessels, if you look at individual blood cells go through a vein, uh, it, that's, that's what it looks like. It has that kind of patterning, that sort of systematic kind of uh, measured response. They all kind of travel at, at a certain speed. And you can see as their feet, um, as they take off, they almost run on the water. That's what that line is, that the, the, the actual water leaving. It creates a vector. And so you can see it in here. Um, this one has always been one of my favorites because in this picture, you actually see a reflection of a bird the bird itself and the shadow in one photograph. Yeah. And again, that's all in camera. All these yes. pictures are, are all in camera. They're not, um, they're not like my day to night images where I'm layering images and stuff like that. So, yeah. You say you spend 36 hours shooting mm -hmm. these, but you spend a lot more time putting in post, them together. Four months. I'm glad you asked that. So, here's how the, let me tell you now the back end, right? Like I've shared with you a little bit about the approach of how I shoot. Hancocking a lens, standing there for 36 hours and looking. The act of seeing is a form of meditation for me. Then it moves, now I come back from the experience and now I sit down in a computer and I edit my pictures. This can take a month to cho choose the best single moments based on time. 
After that month, I work with my retoucher and we actually build the master plate. That can take several months to do. Once I have the master plate, I then take the best moments and those moments get seamlessly blended into the final photograph. The entire process can be four months. That's how much time it takes. I, have, uh, I will make prints this size. Uh, once we have a file that, I've, I, that I, I've, I've tested and I like, we then print it to size and then we examine it and then we rip it up. It goes back in to another round of retouching where we polish it further. I have multiple people that work for me that are multiple eyes because I believe in the fact that one person just can't see everything. You get lost. It's like going to a forest. So I have, uh, over the years, I've been blessed. I have a number of great assistants who still moonlight for me. And I trust their eyes, and they know what, my, what I'm looking for. And I send it to them. And through that, so I have about, you know, 10 pair of eyes going through each file at any one moment. And that's why when you look at my work, it's so seamless. It is... There, there are no you know, mistakes or errors or anything to take you out of what is this experience that I'm doing in terms of compressing time. So it's a very, very um, a methodical process on the back end. I have a whole code system where I use, I create using color codes and numbers, stars, in terms of where I am and based on time is, is always based on a color system. So it enables me at any one moment to figure out where I am, like blue is for clouds, and people always wonder, like, how do, you, how do you merge the cloud? Well, I'm actually thinking about that. I'm thinking about the transition of time as it's happening. So people go, well, how, how do you stay for 36 hours? Well, I, my eye changes with time. So my focus changes with time. And because of that, I'm, I have to be constantly on my toes. You know, it's like I'm always looking. And if it's not a particular animal, I'm looking about did that cloud break away? Did that, did that moment, do, not, do I have a transition now based on time? And that's kind of what I think about, yeah. So it's, uh, it's complicated, but I've been doing this for 10 years. And um, you know, um, I'm now uh, doing a, a new, major new project uh, with the society, uh, Natchez has given me another grant to do, um, and working in concert with Canadian Geographic, I'm gonna be documenting endangered species and habitat in Canada which is going to be a big thing. And this is all for the, uh, the, the 2030 you know, Biosphere uh, project, which is you know, what we're looking at is try to um, use Canada as almost like this, um, this case study in what needs to happen uh, globally. So uh, it's an exciting time. Mm. So when I was a kid, I was pretty enamored with National Geographic magazine. So I'm curious how you became involved with Nat Geo. If you aspired to work for them, or did they find you? Well, it's interesting. I aspired when I was much younger, but I, I didn't. I was a, I was one of three photographers in co in college who was chosen as potentially to be an intern there, mm. and I didn't get the internship. But it it actually worked out because mm. you know at that time, you know every Nat Geo photographer had to fit into the Nat Geo format in a way. Mm. They stylistically had a very strict mm -hmm. kind of guideline. The way you had to photograph and the way you had to yeah. tell the story mm -hmm. was very much the Nat Geo style. And um, that turned out to be really not the best choice yeah. for me as, sure. as an artist. I, I think I worked, um, my mentor is a guy named Jay Maisel, who's a wonderful photographer. And I learned from Jay, he's, well, I remember when I didn't get the internship, he goes, that's the best thing that happened to you, man. Because mm -hmm. now you're going to develop into, your, you know, yeah. you're going to really become your own entity. And so what happened was, I became like this outlier. I started doing all this other work, and then it was through my personal work that Nat Geo came to me. Mm -hmm. So they saw my Ellis Island book. Uh, I documented the south side of Ellis Island, and it was through those pictures I started to have a rapport and a relationship mm -hmm. with the photo editors. And next thing you knew, they gave me my first big assignment. I did a story on Laos, mm -hmm. and um, and subsequently I uh, I pitched them on the idea of for the hundredth anniversary of the national parks um, to pay homage to. Carlton Watkins and uh, Edward Moybridge, I said, let me go photograph the national parks in a way no one's ever seen them before. Moybridge used the mammoth camera, Carlton Watkins did these incredible wet plate pictures. They were doing things that was at the state of the art of technology at that moment, but they were documenting the national parks that way. So I said, let me show people the national parks as time changes. Mm -hmm. So they were like, well, they were interested, but they really weren't sure. And because this was a real radical change. Don't sure. forget, Nat Geo is a bastion of like pure, like, you know, photography yeah. and, you know, no, nothing like that, yeah. you know, no retouching, nothing. And I was 
showing them this, that, that the medium is changing. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to show them that this idea of well, what a still photograph is, is evolving. Mm -hmm. And so I did my first one on my own. I went to Yosemite mm -hmm. and I sent it to the photo editor when I finished it. And I got an email within probably five minutes. <laughs> how do we get in on this? And that's how it started. Uh, they gave me a grant to do a bunch more. And subsequently, it's become a really important vehicle mm -hmm. because that, that picture that Yosemite became the cover of the magazine in 2016 for the January issue. And I had all these, you know, it was an amazing, uh, and it's been an amazing, I value the relationship so much that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I feel like they're my family now. And, uh, but it's, it's the kind of thing where, um, uh, you know, you, I think one of the things that a lot of young photographers always ask me, how do you get it, how do you get it, you know, you have to have a passion and you have to figure out a way to sell your ideas mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an important way. That's really the way, you know. Um, I've always been an idea person and I, I put as much value in making an effort to present my ideas in a way. And sometimes you have to go out and create your ideas, you know. You have to, you know, even with the, 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 the Canadian project, uh, I, I got that grant based on a po photograph I'm going to show tonight and tomorrow. Uh, on, on Canada, I shot grizzly bears day to night in Bella Coola, Canada. So they gave me the grant based on the single image that I created, you know. And that, that's, you know, sometimes you have to do that. You have to, they say, put your money where your mouth is, right? You know, so, uh, yeah. Thanks for that project in Canada. Will you be on the water as well? Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm photographing, uh, the first one I'm doing are the polar bears in Churchill. Uh, which is with the Northern Lights, that's what we're going for. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'm going to be shooting the caribou migration, and then actually beluga whales. I've gotten mm -hmm. access to an amazing area where beluga whales come in, and they're going to allow me to build the scaffolding. And, you know, it's going to be really exciting. And then we're going to be doing a number of other species. In fact, the whole series, now we're looking at expanding it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it could be an amazing story about Canada, because Canada is this unique ecosystem, right? it, because it's, it's certainly something that's... Uh, it's not so large that I, it's not doable, uh, yet it has this incredible diversity, incredible biodiversity. And so we're going to try to um, capture those things, tell those stories, do it in a way that I think is um, melding what I do as an artist day to night, but also telling other stories within the context of with indigenous people. This is connectivity that I'm very interested in now as an artist. I, the things that I've learned in doing these pictures is that, that I truly believe there's a deep connection to everything uh, that's going on, uh, from what, what's happening in the oceans to the trees to everything is connected. And so I want the work to begin to speak uh, to that. I'm actually leaving um, next uh, July 4th. I go to um, I'm going to Greenland, and I'm going to be doing my first day to night in Greenland, 24 hours, and I'm going to be probably going into. Uh, flying into one of the major glaciers and I'm going to create a narrative where you're going to see the icebergs breaking off of a glacier and they're going to be almost like children leaving it. I'm going to create it, I'm going to humanize what's happening with the ice. That's what I'm going to try to do. Mm -hmm. So um, I've had uh, glaciologists talk to me and one of my friends is a major glaciologist just explaining to me how human-like when, when, when an iceberg breaks it's not just a breaking piece of ice that there seems to be this whole release that happens. There's a flow of water that happens before the break happens. It's almost like a mother extending her hand, showing her child where to go, the direction to let go in. And, and, and then, you know, it's, so this is, again, it's this whole idea of connectivity, of what's happening. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to use my, uh, what I do, to tell these stories in a way, I like to say, uh, I'm captivated by the power of beauty. And I think we have so much, we look at so much so many things that are so difficult to see today in terms of what's happening with our environment. But I, I find that when I can show you something that's really beautiful, um, that it accesses you on a different level emotionally and, and hopefully it touches you and then inspires you maybe to, to make a difference. So, yeah. I have kind of an odd question. So, about mm -hmm. like intent. Mm -hmm. So, like, would the day to night images, are they like intended to be? sort of like narrative where we're like we as the viewer are experiencing okay this is like in a linear way with time we're like okay this is day and this is night or is it more about throwing away the concept of time altogether and having sort of experiencing it all at the same time I think it's whatever you want it to be okay <laughs> I, I really mean that I really mean that one of the things I like about um, 
what I try to do in my work is just to create something that has, like I said, there's a harmony to it, right? And then as you, I want, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you curious because there's gonna be something about my work, whether it's the color. You know, one of the things you should know too is uh, people always go, what is he doing to the color? Well, in my work, the color of light is changing over time. And your perception of color changes when the color of light changes. Yeah. So it's a fascinating thing, but if we were all standing in this museum right now, and all these lights were, had magenta filters on, everybody would appear pink for about five minutes. And then our brains would begin to neutralize the pink. That's the way we're wired. We will neutralize and shift it and then accommodate it. You cannot go neutral in my photographs because there's such a subtle change of the color of light happening. And that, that is, it creates a visual dynamic in, in the way you look at my photographs. They become, you know, your eye, it's almost like an excitability within the cones of your retinas. They kind of go like this. That's the color of light and time doing that. So I try to create something that on first glance just is sort of awe. You know, that's what I want you to feel is a sense of awe. What a world we live in. And the other aspect that's really important for me is it's comp compositionally the way your eye sees. So one thing that people don't realize is there's a way a camera sees and then there's a way your eye sees. And what I've been developing over the last 10 years is I'm actually, I'm fi I figured out a way to begin to replicate using digital technology the way my eye sees. Because cameras and lenses have forever defined the way a camera works. So you have 35 millimeter, two and a quarter, four by five, eight by 10. The frame defines the way we see, right? The lens to frame distance defines the way we see. That's not the way we really see, right? We have this, this idea of what is peripheral vision. And what I'm doing is, and I think what's so exciting about this moment in the history of photography is, I, don't, I design the frame based on what my eye sees now, not about what the camera sees. And so I can begin to draw parallels between my vision as you know, a human being versus what I'm photographing and bring that so close that when you look at these pictures, you actually begin to experience it in a way that feels visceral, as if you're standing there. And that's a really important element in my pictures now. Yeah. In, in your work, you're committing to one location and, and one site Yes. Um, at the location. How much time do you spend picking that location? And that are, are you ever, oh no, the, those 36 hours they spent, I should have been over there instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, truthfully, uh, the Grand Canyon uh, image that I did day to night is, um, uh, you know, a very special image. But the first one I did, I threw out. I shot at the Indian Reservation where they had that giant horseshoe, and I got permission. Twenty-four hours of shooting. I, I can't tell you how I killed myself on it. And then I started putting the image together, and I looked at it, and I said, "This is not what I want." The actual architecture of that horseshoe overpowers the canyon. I said, "The canyon." Is the, is, is, is the godly thing in this picture. And so I threw it out, spent the money, threw it out, and went back and was determined to get the perfect view. And I found the <clears throat> Desert View Tower. And then they, they, they allowed me to be up there for 36 hours, and that's where I made the picture. And that's, that's the view I wanted. I wanted the sense of humanity interacting with the canyon for scale, but I didn't want anything else to take away from the grandeur and the beauty of the canyon itself. So to answer your question, yeah, that's... That's something I really think about. And there are times, it doesn't happen a lot, I've been very lucky. Um, but I, when I commit to a place, I really do commit to it. But there have been instances where um, I did one in Bella Coola. I had hired a scout, spent all the money, thought I had the location, got out there, and I realized that when I, as I'm in a boat, literally the day before we're going out to shoot, I discover an outcropping that has the perfect view that I want. I figured out a way to get up to this outcropping, and that's where we did the picture, and it worked perfectly. So sometimes I do tons of planning, but I like to say to people, I do all this planning, but one of the joys of what I do is I have to, I live in the moment, right? So although I have all this noise around me, when I get up there and I look out, I have to be able to see what's in front of me. You know, I have to live in the moment. And you know, a lot of times artists, and, and you do this, writers, everybody, you have this idea, this idea, this idea, and the idea becomes like this, you know, a straitjacket that you're living in. I don't. I don't work that way. So what I do is I do all the homework, and then I drop the jacket, and I'm like a free bird. And then I get to sort of just sort of look around and just go, wow, what's cool about this place? You know, what's happening? 
you know, what's going to happen. And that's kind of the energy I like to go in. And there's a certain bit of uneasiness about that. And I always like to say to people, if I'm not feeling a little uneasy, then I'm not working hard enough. So I have to feel a little uncomfortable. Yeah. You talk about connectivity and raising money for these exhibits. You know, sometimes the feeling is, well, those aren't the animals in our backyard. Right. And trying to create a narrative. I'm trying to create a narrative in my head. You know, what do you tell children or people? I mean, why? Why, 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 yeah. why this matters, yeah. right? Why this matters. What, what they can do from here when they yeah. get... Yeah, action. Yeah. How do you take action? Yeah. So, you know, taking action, uh, my whole philosophy on taking action is um, uh, I've been developing another project based on Rising Seas, a virtual reality experience, actually. It's really exciting. And I've been working on it for about three years, and we're just getting to a point where we're going to start um, creating it. But the, the premise of it is is to give people an emotional experience to what data is, what's really happening. Uh, my work is based on time. In my VR experience, I'm going to actually bring you into the future. You're going to start today, and then you're going to age through the experience. And one of the things that's so interesting is, is how do you identify with the inner child, right? Most people who see what's going on, they go, well, it's 150 years from now, I ain't going to be alive, you know? But, you know, somebody else will think about it. So. I get crazy when I hear that. You know, I absolutely get crazy because I've seen the modeling, I know the data, and most of the scientists I talked to said that if, based on their data and what they know, I asked them if they were conservative. They said if they're so conservative that if they were any other business, they'd be considered irresponsible. And these are what some of the top climate da data scientists have told me. So making people understand that action is critical to this, but how, what do you do? What is it? So my whole thing is it's if we could all do one little thing, right? And the beauty of one thing is, is that once you do the one thing and it makes you feel good, you end up wanting to do another thing. And that becomes this thing that spreads. And, and so I think the way to go, for me personally, is simplicity. Make it easy for people to become a part of this movement in a way. And by doing one thing, you know, whether it's like changing all your light bulbs in your house, getting an electric car, um, you know, doing what you can do in terms of water conservation, in terms of, and whatever it is you're going to do, do one thing, feel good about that, and that has a way to connect. And I think if you do that, um, it's, a, it's a way to get a, gra a groundswell, because I do think that people, once they feel good about, about make, you know, doing their little piece, they want to do more. And, and, it, and it, that's the hard thing. I think for most people, it becomes overwhelming. Like, you, you overwhelm them with, oh, you got to do this, 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 and this. No, I think it's just like, let's do one thing at a time. Let's all do one little thing. Pass it on. You know, so somebody you know, your best friends, hey, let's do one thing. Every, every week, <clears throat> we try to do, or every month, let's try to do one new thing, you know, that makes a difference. So that's what I would say. Yeah. This is a silly, this is a silly question. Sure. But based on your beautiful new sneakers and the amount of time you spend standing photographing, is there a brand of shoe that is your <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you, you have no idea. Uh, <laughs> You switch okay. shoes? You stay in the same No, I, I, I stand for, you know, sometimes, depending, like, you know, if you're in a very rocky climate, unstable, you have to be in sort of a hiking shoe that has higher ankle support. Um, so I do stuff like that. I'm, you know, uh, I've been, a I have some other issues right now physically that I'm dealing with, so my next trip is going to be very tricky. I can't really lift or do anything like I normally do. So my next shoe is probably the biggest challenge I've ever had physically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have to have some surgery, but I'm delaying it, and I, I can't, you know, like, it, it is a little scary when you go to remote places and you know you're not really 100%, and if something happens, you know, you got to, so I've got to be extra careful this next trip. But, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, I'm not, you know, 24 anymore, and my assistants, you know, are younger, and so, but I grind them into the ground most of the time, frankly. And, but it's getting harder, you know, it gets harder. I, I've been doing this for 10 years, and I, I've, got, I've got, I know I have a certain window where my energy is such that I can keep doing it physically, so I'm gonna to try to do as many of these things as I can. And I've decided that rather than devoting it to, you know, just 
places, I want to devote it to the environment. I want it to focus more on capturing the world. I do believe that my work, I think 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, becomes, they become windows into the way we live and the way the earth was. And I'm hoping the way the earth will still remain. So it's, it's just that, if, if, so for my mission now is I'm really driven by trying to create experiences with this VR experience um, about rising seas to, to create action, to do things that, the reason I'm drawn to VR right now is because I believe that it actually affects your brain. Um, when, you, I, when, you, um, when you get into, a, and I'm talking VR experience, what's called immersive VR. So you go into these places, a company called The Void, I don't know if any, I'm, any of you have heard of it, but it's the state of the art. Those are the guys that I'm working with, and they are really, um, when you go into their experiences, um, it affects your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, the good guys have to get out in front of this technology. Because mm -hmm. I've seen enough of what the bad guys are doing and, firsthand. And, and the truth is, is that, um, um, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I photographed uh, the Deepwater Horizon spill. I was hired by Time Magazine mm -hmm. to photograph. I actually flew over the well the day they were capping the well. And I watched from above in a helicopter. It was a two-hour flight just to get to the well site. And I was the only photojournalist in the helicopter. The rest were ABC News and CBS. They were video guys. And one of the things that struck me, it, it actually overwhelmed me, was there was no oil on the water. Here it is, day 33 or whatever, how many days this thing had been belching oil. And I'm looking, where is the oil? Why is there no oil on the surface of the water? And what I saw was an armada of ships around the epicenter of where the break was. And they all had pipes going down. And what I found out afterwards is they were pumping Corexit into the mouth. They were essentially dispersing the oil as it was coming out of the well site. And they were sinking it to the bottom of the Gulf. And when so people are hearing this whole story now that's going on about the Gulf and, you know, about the largest dead zone ever recorded, make no mistake, dead zone is because of one thing, it's the BP oil that's there. They sunk all that oil to the bottom. And what I realized as a photojournalist was, they brought me in to tell the lie of their story. Yeah. That's yeah. how clever these guys yeah. were. They sunk the oil, and this is what I'm telling you, that this is, this is one, it's, it's us against them. Trust me when I tell you they are highly evolved. Yeah. And so we have to start really upping our game uh, in a way that really affects people in a different way. Because they understand that if you take the, uh, the actual visual side of the story, when you own the visual story, you own the story. That's it. And that's what they did. And I was, I was used by them mm -hmm. to communicate that. And so once that happened, that's when the whole idea for me about taking it to a next level, a VR experience, and wanting to take over what, you know, take claim to what, you know, because to me, again, if I can affect your consciousness, that's, that's, that's the ultimate storytelling, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you.